Hi, my name is Brian Kaplan. Welcome to this week and last week's Ask Brian. I had the flu last week, so I didn't do a video. So this week I'm gonna have a double feature with two separate videos. Okay, this week I got kind of a interesting, a little bit weird question, but it was it's still a good one nonetheless. And someone asked me, how do you determine the maximum sample size that you need for some sort of statistical study? Which is interesting because normally we, in statistics, cover how you figure out the minimum sample size. So let me talk very briefly about statistical hypothesis testing and power, and then I'll get to answering the question. So this is really goes to how we determine the minimum sample size required. So um, usually we have some sort of hypothesis test. So we have some null hypothesis, say mu equals some mu or some difference equals zero. Then we have the distribution of a test statistic under the null hypothesis, and then we have a distribution of a test statistic under the alternative hypothesis, say mu is equal to some mu a value or something like that. Okay, so what we usually do, so this is, this is the distribution, the density of a test statistic under uh, H naught, and this is the distribution under H a. So let's, let's, let's um, assume we pick a line or something like that and under the null hypothesis so that if we reject, right, we control the type 1 error rate at 5%, so that the probability of rejecting if the null hypothesis is true is 5%. Well then, if the alternative is true, this line remains fixed, and then we look at the probability of rejecting under the alternative, right? It's a much bigger area, of course, and that is called power. This little area over here is called the type 2 error rate. Type 2 error rate is just 1 minus the power. Okay, now as, as our, our sample size increases, our our densities get uh, more concentrated around their means, typically, and, well, pretty much always. And um, because of that, when we set our line, right, to get 5%, 5% error rate, now we have much bigger power. So what you can do is calibrate your sample size so that you get the power that you want in, in your study. You get the probability that you reject the null hypothesis to be at a tolerable level. You're always controlling in the classical way in which uh, uh, statistical hypothesis testing and study planning is executed, you're always controlling the type 1 error rate and forcing it to be small. And so what, you know, the sample size is what you have under your control to try and control the type 2 error rate or to make the power as big as you, as you need, as you want it to be. Okay, and that's usually set to obtain the minimum sample size in order to get the power that you want, a minimally tolerable amount of power. And people often throw around numbers for power like 80% or something like that. Now, how do you determine the maximum sample size? Well, first of all, there is, I think, a, quite a few people who, when they look at traditional hypothesis testing, would say that we tend to grossly underpower studies that even if all the knobs and dials that we have to turn to do a power calculation are correctly set, which they never are, um, right? Um, we set it for things like 80% power. Why is 80% power tolerable? To you know, why is that? Why are we okay with a 5% type 1 error rate, but a 20% type 2 error rate? Is that well calibrated to whatever specific problem we're looking at? Are type 1 errors and type 2 errors really that asymmetric? in order to set that way. Okay, so there is a lot of considerations like that that I think would be valid criticisms for that would go into uh, the minimum and maximum sample size that you would want in a study. Um, however, in terms, of, uh, in terms of just purely looking at a maximum sample, sample size, that's usually determined by non-statistical considerations and structural considerations in the study. So one of the most important instances of this is, of course, if you're doing animal studies and you're sacrificing, you're killing the animals in the process of the study or after the study, and then obviously you want to have the smallest possible sample size because you want to kill the least things. And this becomes increasingly important as the, as the you know, the sort of order of the animals goes up. So this process is incredibly scrutinized for higher order primates with good reason. And, and it's, it's scrutinized pretty well for, you know, kind of low order K adaptive type species, you know, mice, maybe people are a little less concerned about it. But if you try to put in a primate study, a really invasive primate study, 
and you need to, you know, and you actually have the money to study a couple extra primates, the study section uh, the, or the, and, the, and the review boards for that are really going to scrutinize it very heavily because you're going to have to kill these animals. These are, you know, uh, higher order animals. Anyway, so that's obviously a good reason to, to put some structural constraints on the maximum number of, of uh, the, the sample size that you can have. Some people would say the maximum ethical sample size in that, in that setting is zero. Um, but you know, that's a different discussion. But anyway, it's one of the structural constraints that go into a study. Uh, of course, another structural constraint is money. If you have something like a clinical trial and where subjects are <clears throat> being enrolled in a clinical trial, uh, that is usually very expensive. It's thousands of dollars per subject is the, is the typical number. And so you have a financial limit to how much you're willing to spend on the study, and that usually constrains the sample size. <clears throat> it's interesting to know in clinical trials, if you're doing some, some of the kind of modern clinical trials where you're taking looks at the data every now and then, but there's also these kind of equipoise issues that would come into play with the maximum sample size. At some point, you'll collect enough data where you'll know the truth. You'll either, either treatment is effective or the treatment is ineffective. And if it's effective, then everyone should be getting it. And if it's ineffective, then no one should be getting it. So once you hit a state of knowledge where you actually kind of know things, then it's unethical to add more subjects to the clinical trial. So there are some equipoise constraints put on the maximum sample size as well. <clears throat> Now this is all in the context of hypothesis testing. Um, presumably the person asking the question was also thinking in terms of things like machine learning, where there's no hypothesis testing to speak of, so there's no power, but there still is potential sample size considerations. You might want to pick a sample size so that your clusters, when you're doing a clustering algorithm, are so accurate, or your, um, your prediction error is minimized at a certain level. and. Um, you know, even in some of these gigantic machine learning settings, your maximum sample size is, of course, hindered by um, constraints of kind of things like hassle. I mean, certainly financial constraints, but let's suppose the marginal cost of adding another subject is so minimal as to be effectively zero. Um, it still adds hassle to add tons and tons of subjects. So if you're Google and you're doing um, deep mind to train images, Right, adding another 100 terabytes of images is no problem because you have another 100 terabytes of images no, you know, really quickly. The problem isn't, isn't the cost of getting it. It's the hassle of executing the algorithm on the larger and larger data set. It's the storage issues and all the other kind of hassle-related things that would come about. And, of course, financial costs that, that come about from, from storing the data, working with the data, the computing power, and so on. So at any rate, what it boils down to is that the maximum sample size is typically set by some sort of structural non-statistical constraints in the problem. Um, so I hope that's a pretty direct answer to that question. If you want to learn more about how you do the mathematics for calculating the minimum sample size, especially in hypothesis testing, we have lots of classes for that. We have our statistical inference class and our data science specialization. I have the classes Mathematical Biostatistics Boot Camp 1 and 2. And I don't know if I specifically cover this in my linear models classes on Coursera, but um, I cover all the things that you need to learn how to do this for a linear model in the Coursera classes. Basically, under normality, you just need something like a non-central F distribution. So at any rate, uh, if you get a chance, subscribe. Um, I'll put some links to subscribe to the newsletter also in the description section of the YouTube, uh, um, the YouTube video. I will have another video this week and uh, look forward to seeing you then.